The Kingdom of Sweden was never famous for having a great navy. It's mostly remembered for the Vasa, the flagship which sank on her maiden voyage, within full view of the capital city. Whilst it was an embarrassing and costly incident, the consequences were not that serious. The war in Poland ended in a truce, and it's unlikely that the presence of the Vasa would have changed the outcome too much. In the coming years, Sweden would rise to become a local power in the Baltic Sea. There was a naval disaster which was much worse than the Vasa. In 1676, a Swedish flagship twice the size of the Vasa, carrying twice as many cannons, capsized and exploded. 800 men perished in an instant. This was in the full view of both her allies and her enemies, and it resulted in a naval invasion of Swedish soil. Some blame it on luck, bad luck of the Swedes or good luck of the Danish, others on the incompetence of its sailors and commanders. Some even blame it on a curse put on the ship's commander after his savage persecution of witches. This is the disaster of Regalskeppet Stora Krona, the Great Crown. Lorenzo Magalotti was one of the few outlanders lucky enough to witness what he called La Corona di Svezia, the Swedish crown, as she lay moored in the capital. Magalotti had been to the Netherlands and England, but had never seen anything like her, a floating palace. Her rigging reached towards the heavens as if in hubris. She was adorned with magnificent sculptures in the shapes of golden women and leering faces, between which were beautifully colored coats of arms, symbolizing the king and provinces. Throning the stern were two cherubians, below them the ship's namesake, the royal crown, carried on its flanks by two golden lions. In the middle of everything was a bust of the king himself. The king could also be found on the flanks of the helm and riding his horse as the ship's figurehead. He was dressed in the attire of a Roman triumphant and carried a marshal's cane. This was a ship of war, after all. In terms of size, let's compare the crown to the Vasa. The Vasa had weighed 1,210 tons, whereas the crown weighed 2,300. Before the crown, only two ships in the world had been larger. The 3,000 ton Padre Eterno and the 2,700 ton Royal Sovereign. The crown carried as many as 114 cannons whereas the Vasa had only carried 64. These guns weren't small either, most of them were 24 pounders. You can probably imagine the cost yourself, that's a lot of tax money, or just money stolen from the Polish. Her chief architect was an Englishman named Francis Sheldon, this was not a coincidence. According to legend, King Charles X had seen the English navy in action, and was so impressed that he wanted to imitate their style. Historians believe today that the reasons were mostly political. Historically, the Dutch had been responsible for the shipbuilding industry in Sweden. But since the Dutch were now rivaling Swedish trade in the Baltic, relations were souring. So, Sweden wanted to become friends with England, who were enemies with the Dutch. Welcome to 17th century politics. Of course, some Swedes argued for the superiority of English ships. Dutch hulls could enter shallow waters thanks to their flat bottoms, whereas the more V-shaped English hulls were superior at high tide and strong winds. By the time Magalotti saw her, the mighty ship had sailed for six years, though never seen actual battle. That raises the question of why she was built in the first place. A super ship like that had limited tactical implementations. The Dutch won most of their naval battles with lighter and faster ships. Most of Sweden's naval battles were fought with much smaller vessels, such as ore-powered galleys. These battles were also likewise far in between. Between 1563 and 1718, Sweden only fought 50 naval battles, compared with the hundreds of land engagements. Most of these sea battles ended inconclusively, and only 10 were victories. Sweden was never known as a naval power, that kudos goes to Denmark. In 1676, Sweden was at the height of her power, having conquered enough territory to become the dominating power in the Baltic Sea. Kronan was a manifestation of Sweden's imperial splendor. Building a floating palace was the same as building any other palace for national glory and prestige. However, her maiden voyage was not so splendorous. As soon as she hit the water, she struck the ocean floor, damaging the back of the keel. Some said the ship brought bad luck. By 1676, the Swedish navy consisted of 66 ships, 2,222 cannons, 7,000 sailors and 3,000 soldiers. These men came from across Sweden's holdings. One of them was Per Elofsson Blank, from a small village on the eastern shore of Öland, not far from where the crown would sink. 
he and 800 comrades would lose their lives in the disaster. In the aftermath, Öland was ransacked by Danish forces, and Per's family members likely suffered the brutal consequences. Whilst many of the sailors were recruited from coastal provinces, this didn't ensure any sailing veterancy. The Danish said that the Swedish navymen were peasant boys, and indeed, many sailors were even recruited from inland provinces. However, most of the sailors, and especially the officers, both major and minor, were drawn from experienced seafarers. Veteran gunners, navigators and artisans were vital cogs to keep a machine like the crown afloat. There was one exception, however, and that was the admiral himself, Lorenz Kreutz. Due to his extensive contacts in the government, Lorenz Kreutz had been appointed chief of the admiralty and commander aboard the crown. This decision was disputed by Klaus Ugla, who argued that the navy had completely different needs from the army, and that Kreutz was incompetent. Indeed, Kreutz lacked any naval or military expertise whatsoever. He had been raised into nobility after many years of diligent civil servitude. The most dramatic period of his life was his role as commissioner of witchcraft in Dalarna, essentially the hillbilly country of Sweden. After years of plague, neglect and warfare, the people of Sweden were looking for an answer. The nobility said that witchcraft was to blame. Most likely the witchcraft trials were a convenient way to keep the people distracted and terrified. The trials were conducted arbitrarily. Children were taken as reliable witnesses when they pointed out women that they had seen traveling on brooms with Satan. Victims said refused to confess were tortured. Roughly 20 women were hanged and burned at the stake. Legend says that the terrified people cast a curse on the damned Lorenz Kreutz, or that the very woodwork of the crown had been pulled from ancient woods, still bearing the damnations of old and terrible deities. It is unknown why Kreutz accepted the position as admiral. Perhaps he was ambitious and power-hungry, or maybe he was just afraid to say no to such a gracious offer. But as a civilian and a land crab, he garnered no respect from his subordinates. Scania had been a vital part of Denmark for her entire existence. But in the last decade, the wealthy province had passed over to Sweden. In the following hundred years, the Scanians would have their Danish identity obliterated in the most effective cultural genocide of history. But this is a topic for another video. In 1675, Denmark declared war on Sweden with the goal to liberate Scania. The Swedish navy weighed anchor and the crown was her spearhead. The expedition didn't start out well. The crown lost an anchor and had to turn around. That winter the sea around Stockholm froze and the crown had to stay harbored. Relations soured in the command chain and Admiral Kreutz was openly disliked by his subordinates. When spring came, the ice broke and the tide carried the war fleet down the coast towards her inevitable doom. On the 26th of May, the Swedish encountered a Danish Dutch fleet south of Scania. The Dutch admiral came alongside the crown. Big mistake. The crown's cannons were massive. Most of them fired cannonballs that weighed 24 pounds. The biggest were 36 pounders and could weigh as much as 4.5 tons. Just look at these pictures. You could stick your head in that muscle. They had been loaded with bar shot, meaning two cannonballs merged with an iron bar, similar in appearance to a dumbbell. Up close and personal, they shredded the Dutchman to pieces. One witness said that you could drive a wagon and a horse through the holes. However, the battle was nothing to celebrate. After successfully running through the enemy line, most of the ships were thrown into disorder. Kreutz himself waved around his saber and tried rallying the fleet, but no one listened to his tantrum. Rather than pursuing the enemy, most of them decided to go against Kreutz's previous orders and disengage. The battle ended inconclusively. What could have been a victory ended only ominously. Mistrust and rivalries kept growing within the fleet. Kreutz's leadership was mistrusted, bordering on mutiny. After recuperating at Trelleborg, the fleet set sail once more. The Danish king had given his navy strict orders to search and destroy. Their goal was a decisive battle, and the Danes were hungry for glory. Leading them was a famous Dutchman named Cornelis Tromp. Tromp was one of the greatest naval commanders of his time, having extinguished himself in the wars against England. They tracked the Swedish fleet to the southern cape of Öland, a long island just off the Swedish coast. The Danish intercepted the Swedes by sticking close to the shore. They managed to get a superior position, or weather gauge, with the wind at their backs and the enemy in front. In response, the Swedish tried to flee, maybe get in a better position, 
It became hard to control the disorganized fleet, and soon the ships were spread out over a large area. The Crown prepared for battle. All guns were loaded with double cannonballs, meant to cause maximum damage. The wind was picking up. Masts and rigging creaked. The enemy was right in front of them. Witnesses disagreed on what happened next. Thanks to miscommunications, much of the Swedish fleet suddenly decided to just turn around. Some say that a Swedish ship had fired a gun to signal this maneuver. Others say that the signal came from a Dutch vessel. Anyway, since the entire fleet was coming about, the Crown was forced to do the same, lest she'd sail alone into the enemy's firing line. But suddenly turning a big ship in strong winds was a huge risk, and the Crown was not kitted out to do so. Before leaving Stockholm, her ballast had been lightened, without reducing the amount of cannons aboard, severely impacting her stability. At the same time, she was at full sail, her gun ports were open, and all the heavy guns were out. According to Captain Rosenberg, Kreutz told the sailmaster the following words. In Jesus' name, make sure the gun ports are shut and the guns lashed, so that when we turn, we don't suffer the fate of the ship Vasa. That humiliating disaster of the Vasa, 48 years prior, was still fresh in the memories of the Swedish nation. Remembrance was not sufficient to halt this debacle. As she turned, the crown fell to the side. Some men tried to shift the cannons, others tried to reef the sails. A heavy wind capsized the ship and fell her flat on the side. Water gushed through the open gun ports. The ship was sinking. Masses of tightly packed men were trapped like rats in the claustrophobic compartments of the lower decks, as guns whipped around, crushing them alive. In the chaos, a man in the powder magazine dropped his lantern and started a fire. The detonation was so powerful that it tore the ship in half, sending bodies, ordnance and equipment flying high in the air. The shockwave rippled across the stormy waves, and the cleaved remnants of the floating palace descended into the boiling deeps. Within a few minutes, 800 men had lost their lives. 40 men survived the sinking of the crown. Most of them had fallen into the sea before the explosion, and were rescued a few hours later. Lieutenant Anders Sparfeldt had miraculously survived, being blasted away by the explosion, and into the rigging of the ship Dragon. Lorenz Kreutz was not amongst the survivors. A mangled body floating in the sea was later identified as him, thanks only to the family sigil in his pocket. He was buried in a family grave in Finland. Modern divers were able to recover his golden gorget, a sort of military insignia that was worn around the neck. Battle wasn't over yet. Kreutz's old rival, Klaus Ugla, was now in charge of the fleet aboard the ship's sword. Whilst the Swedish fleet was in disarray, Ugla's ship was surrounded and bombarded. Cannon fire shredded razor sharp splinters around the gun deck, lacerating anyone at random. Spiked cannonballs clove torsos in half. The mainmast was shot off. Musketeers and gunners worked feverishly to keep the enemy off. After two and a half hours, a Dutch fire ship collided with the sword. She caught fire and exploded. Klaus Ugla joined his rival in the depths of the sea. To the Danish, it was one of their most astounding victories. 42 ships had defeated a Swedish fleet of 60, losing only 100 men and one fire ship. They captured two ships, 90 guns, and 500 prisoners of war. It would forever be memorialized by propaganda pieces, and magnificent paintings such as this one, made by Klaus Möniken. For the Swedish, it was the greatest and most costly naval disaster in its history. Not only had they lost one of the most expensive ships ever built, but the massive war chest kept aboard had likewise gone down to the depths. The king wanted the blood of whoever was responsible. A 15-month legal process ended anticlimactically. The goal was to map out the reasons behind the disaster and identify the guilty, but they never found anything. Only three of the 40 survivors, all officers of the fleet, could be considered sort of responsible, and it just wasn't enough. In the end, they were acquitted, and nothing more happened. The war itself was far from over. Its first victims were the denizens of Erland, as the Danes and Dutchmen made landfall and ransacked the countryside. Four weeks later, they invaded Scania, much to the jubilation of the oppressed locals. However, the young Swedish king, Charles XI, proved to be an excellent commander. On the 4th of December, 1676, he won a decisive battle near Lund. 
In this insane bloodbath, 9,000 Swedes, Danes and Hollanders perished. That was 40% of the partaking soldiers. Per capita, it was one of the bloodiest battles ever fought on European soil, even superseding the battlefields of the 20th century. Peace was eventually signed in 1678, with Sweden retaining all of its territories. Already in 1679, Sweden made efforts to salvage parts of the ship. By using diving bells, they managed to recover bits of rigging, hull and other building elements. Of most value were the cannons, which had constituted nearly half of the ship's expenditures. One of the 36-pounder cannons weighed 4.5 tons, half a ton heavier than the average automobile today. The recovery efforts were quite impressive, considering the crude methods of the day. Between 1679 and 1686, 60 cannons were recovered. Most of them were melted down and made into lighter cannons for more cost-effective ships than the Crown. 300 years later, on the 8th of August, 1980, the research ship Mare Balticum discovered the remnants of the Crown. Of course, it was far from a picturesque shipwreck. The explosion had torn her in two, and by now her remnants lay scattered across the bottom of the Baltic. As evidence, the researchers salvaged a bronze cannon. Interestingly, it had been forged in 1628, same year as the sinking of the Vasa. The project leader, Anders Fransén, had likewise been responsible for discovering the wreck of the Vasa. To this day, divers are still recovering artifacts from the crown. Most of them are stored at the museum in Kalmar. His Majesty himself, King Charles XVI, is the protector of the recovery project and has personally dived down to visit the wreckage. The sinking of the crown was the most humiliating naval disaster in Swedish history. A massive and beautiful flagship, virtually a floating palace, had gone down to the deeps. The loss in lives and resources was staggering. She had been built to inspire, but was seen as an omen of bad luck, until she inspired nothing but shame. However, the disaster is usually overshadowed by the more famous sinking of the Vasa, even though the consequences of the crown were much more severe. The Swedish navy was crippled, and Sweden itself was invaded. Even though Sweden came decently out of the war, things might have gone much better had the crown survived. Or maybe she needed to explode, so that the Swedes would stop spending so much money on prestige projects, and invest in a more cost-effective navy instead. In the 1700s, Sweden invested heavily in its archipelago fleet, consisting mostly of galleys and gunboats, which effectively fought off the Russians. However, that's a story for another day. The wreck of the crown has also been a treasure trove for modern historians. It has been called the Pompeii of the Baltic Sea. So many well-preserved artifacts have been recovered that give us a valuable insight into the life in the 1600s. They have found everything from clothes to medicines, to the gorget of Admiral Kreutz himself. The question remains, if Lorenz Kreutz deserves the blame for the disaster. What do you think? Should he have been replaced? Had he truly been cursed by witchcraft? Tell me in the comments.